When the Atari ST was released in 1985, the internet was only two years old and the World Wide Web wasn't even a twinkle in Tim Berners-Lee's eyes. In fact, the World Wide Web wouldn't be invented for another four years in 1989. So the question we're going to answer today is, can we browse the internet in 2024 on a computer that came out before the World Wide Web existed? So let's do that. So how are we going to do this? We're going to take a look at the net USB cartridge for the Atari ST. As the name suggests, it's a cartridge that provides networking and USB support for the Atari ST. I bought mine from the Retro Lemon website. They're currently in stock and they retail for around 70 quid. And here it is in situ on an Atari ST FM. So first impressions of this device when you unbox it is of its heft. The case is made of steel, or at least my magnet tells me it is, and it feels solid and weighty in the hand. Now there are two sets of connectors on the net USB. On the left is a single RJ45 connector for Ethernet, and on the right there are two USB-A sockets. Now to achieve our task today, it's the Ethernet connector that we're going to be looking at. The net USB has a party trick. I mean, actually, if you look around YouTube for videos about the net USB, you'd think that this is all that it does. And that party trick is to enable fast and easy round tripping of files to and from an Atari computer, STTT, Falcon, whatever. And that's done via an app called UIP. Now, since we're going to be transferring a lot of files to my ST today when getting online, let's have a quick wander around and see what it does. So let's start, as they say, with this one cool trick you won't believe. And I promise you that won't be the thumbnail. Here, <laughs> here we are on my Atari ST FM. So this ST has four meg of memory. It's running Magic as its multitasking system and Genie as a desktop. So let's run the UIP app. Okay, it's a toss app and it runs in the V52 terminal emulator. When it starts up, it gets an IP address via DHCP and starts acting as a very small web server, which we're gonna access from our Mac or our PC. On my Mac, I navigate to the IP address that was shown on the ST and the UI of uh, UIP appears very quickly on the screen. Let's just go over the options. We can select the drive we're operating on. Currently we're on C. And there's a little breadcrumb here that will show where we are on that drive. We can change drives using these buttons. Let's uh, we'll have a quick look at A and then we'll go back to C. Now, before we get to uploading files, which is the primary use case of this device, let's have a look at downloading files. I'm just going to go into the Gemsys folder and then I'm going into Guides. And here we see a list of SD guide files. I'm going to click on genie.hype to download it. And if we go into the Downloads folder on my Mac, we can see it just finishing up downloading. Downloads are limited to one file at a time. So to download multiple files, you'll need to archive them, say in a zip file and download that zip file. Speaking of which, let's have a look on the D drive and create a folder called install at the root level. Now, the first thing you have to remember, and I often forget to do, is to select the newly created folder to CD into it. Now I'm gonna upload a folder of archivers, which I might need in the future. I drop the folder into the drop zone on the UIP user interface. And there on the left hand side, we see a list of files being transferred or to be transferred. In the middle is a list of file transfers. And then on the right is a list of completed files. And there's a progress bar there that tracks the individual uploads. Now in real use, I have, I've found that if any one file fails to transfer, the entire upload is halted. Now these failures are actually really, really rare. And it's usually when you're transferring files with strange characters in them. I had a speedo GDOS cache file that had a, either a tilde or a hash in it and it just didn't like that. Okay, let's go back on the ST and we'll quit UIP and quickly check out D install archivers. And yep, there are our files that we transferred. So that's UIP in action. And I think it's pretty impressive. Now, there is a fairly obvious question is, here is, how do we bootstrap this process? How do we get UIP onto the ST in the first place? Well, in my case, I use good old fashioned sneaker net to transfer UIP onto the hard drive via a floppy disk. But that's something you only do once. There are two components that we need to source and install to get on the web. And the first thing is a TCP IP stack. This is a software protocol that allows the routing of packets via the internet. And we're gonna use a TCP IP stack called Sting. The other thing, of course, that we need to surf the web is a web browser. And we're going to install CAB, which is the Crystal Atari browser. Okay, let's get to installing stuff. 
I've copied a few things up to the ST using UIP. And here in the install folder, I have both the UIP tool we've just looked at, the net USB folder that contains drivers for the USB side of things, and Sting, our TCP IP stack. You might find it a little surprising in the modern day that back then, and all the way up to the era of probably Windows 3.1.1, TCP IP was not included in the operating system by default. And in many cases, it was actually a paid for product. Installing Sting is a matter of dragging and dropping some files and folders because there isn't an installer app. So here we can see we have some auto folder content, some control panel extensions, a set of drivers and config files, some tools that allow you to test the stack once it's installed, and some help files. So we'll start with the help files and we'll just put them into our guides folder. And just to show you that it's well documented, here it is. And I mean, you know, this level of documentation was because back in the day when the internet was new to most people, they needed their hands holding quite a bit. And it contains charming lines like, the internet is becoming increasingly more popular. Well, I mean, to me, that's quite funny when nowadays your fridge is probably on the internet. The Sting folder contains drivers and config files, and I like to put things like that into the Gemsys folder. So I'm going to move that over there. Next, we put the Sting auto folder items into our auto folder, and auto folder items are just programs that are run at startup by the operating system. And we're going to edit the Sting.in file. And what we need to do here is tell the Sting driver where we put the drivers folder. So I'll add a Gemsys to the path and save that. Now inside the Sting folder in Gemsys, there are two files we need to modify. The first is default.cfg. And what we need to do here is set our name server. And we're going to use 8.8.8.8, .8 which is Google's public name server. And of course, we have to use the IP address of the name server, because how do you find out the IP address of the name server if you don't know what the name server is? So it's a bootstrapping thing. We'll save that and we're going to edit the file root.tab. We're going to go right to the end and edit the final line of the file and change that last address to the IP address of our router, which in our case is 192.168.50.1. Now your router will be on a different IP address. What this line actually says is root all packets and all subnets via the ethernet to, this, to the router or gateway as it was called back then. And we need to make sure that those entries on that line are separated by tabs, not spaces. Sting comes with three control panel extensions that we use to set it up. And we're going to move them into our, Gems our CPX folder in Gemsys. Now, I'm not taking the serial control panel extension as we're not using a serial port or a modem. So, yeah, we're just using Ethernet. Now I'm going to pop in a cheeky little reboot to get those auto folder apps loaded and in memory. Now, post the reboot, let's go into the control panel. So there are our three new extensions all stacked on top of one another. So we'll tidy them up. And then let's go through the extensions. Sting internals allows you to check the version numbers of different components. It doesn't actually configure anything. It just tells you what the versions are. Now next, the main config is in here in port setup. We're on Ethernet. That actually matches that line in the roots.tab file. And I've allocated a static IP address for my ST on my router. I don't show you how to do that here because your router will differ from mine, but you should reserve one because if you end up accidentally with two computers on the same network with the same IP address, bad things happen. So I enter the IP address of 192.168.50.77 and our subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 and we need to make sure it's active or it won't work. Now under hardware, we're going to pick NE2000. The MAC address we'll leave alone. It'll be picked up dynamically from the card when the driver boots. And we'll save those settings. And there you can see the sting.prt file that starts the settings being created in the root of the C drive. Under protocols, we have a look at the resolver config and we see that it's picked up the name server from the default.config file we edited earlier. So nothing to change here. Right, it's time to test. So first, we'll do a ping on the loopback device to see if TCP IP stack is sane. 50 packets sent, 50 received, none lost. So far, so good. So let's ping something out on the internet, and we'll go for Google's name server. And again, complete success. So there you go, we have a working internet. The next step is to install the web browser, CAB. Now to do that, we need to copy the files over to the ST using UIP again. And this begs the question, does having a TCP IP stack in place now affect UIP? 
And UIP is different to Sting. If you remember, it got its IP address automatically using DHCP. So if we run UIP, we get the error message. UIP tool doesn't work with stick. Sorry. First of all, stick was Sting's predecessor. And you might think, well, is this the end of the world? Well, obviously not. There is a simple workaround. I'm going to reboot the ST and when the ICD logo appears, I'll hit the D key and ICD will boot from the D drive. So that's vanilla toss, no magic, no sting, no problems. And when we open the D drive and run UIP, it works fine. So let's upload our web browser. I've created a subfolder under install on the D drive called cab and I'm uploading the files there. And by the magic of editing, here we are on the ST with the 172 files uploaded. Now in our cab folder, we have the cab installation files and the cab overlay. And in the cab folder, there's the installer itself and some translated resources that we're going to overlay on the originals to turn the UI from German into English. Now, before we run the installer, let's open the super secret serial number file. Just a reminder that this software was actually transferred into the public domain quite a few years ago. So we're not, we're not breaking any laws here. Now this uses Ash Software's standard installer. So the serial number and the name are required fields. Now the only thing I dislike about this installer is you can choose the drive to install on and the folder name to install into, but it will only install the software in that name folder at root level. So we're going to install on D and then we'll move it into bin afterwards. I'll save you five minutes of your life and skip to the end. So now here on D we have our cab folder and the PPP folder. That is, we'll just delete that later, we're not going to use it. I'm going to open the install folder again and copy the English language patch files over the originals. And we'll do that in the cab folder and then in the modules folder. And that's it. Localization complete. So the final step is to replace the original cab overlay module with one that's net USB stroke ethernet aware. Now it took ages to find the right version of this overlay f for our combination of this version of cab and this version of sting. A day or so of trying different versions, having it fail, trying to work out what's going on. And then finally it worked when you get the right versions. Let's run the crystal browser and I can be the silver surfer that I am. Now I think that icon is an information superhighway, and that's a term I hadn't heard for decades, which is why it's in the title of this video. So let's run it. Now don't get your hopes up. This is pretty flake. Clicking on just about any modern website from this browser will result in a crash due to memory errors. However, the YouTube channel Action Retro hosts a page called the Frog Find, which wraps DuckDuckGo for search. And then when you click on a link from the search results, the server downloads the page, scrapes out all the graphics and stuff and turns it into a simple page for you. And he uses it to test his retro computers. OK, let's pick a topic. That's topical. And the Golden Globes were last night, so we'll search for that. Now, it takes a little bit of time for the results to come back, but I'm not going to speed it up as I want you to see it warts and all. But that's pretty good, I think, for a machine that was released in 1985, 38 and a half years ago. OK, let's open the list of nominees. And yes, that's readable. Fully prepared for doom scrolling, we are. Finally, let's go back and click on a link that's problematic. Let's go for the Guardian website. Yeah, and that doesn't look too good, does it? I'm not sure if that's cab browser's fault or frog find having issues, but you know what they say about the talking duck. It's not important how good its diction is. It's the fact that it can talk at all. Well, we did it. We got on the web in 2024 using a computer that was designed and released before the World Wide Web actually existed. I mean, not that my Atari ST is ever going to be my daily driver for surfing the web. But occasionally when I'm troubleshooting problems on it, I might be able to use a frog finder to search for a solution without having to go off and use an iPad or a Mac or something like that. So that's good. Now, I would like to get some other protocols running with um, with the ST. So I'd like to get an FTP client working on there and possibly even a Gopher client. But that's for another day. But getting on the web is only 
half of the capability of the USB. Get USB there is. And next video, we're going to investigate the USB side of this. So I want to get an external keyboard, an external mouse working on this. I want to be able to use a USB storage device as a hard drive on my ST. And I really like to be able to print from the ST because sometimes there are files in formats that you can't print from a Mac or a PC. And so you need to get a printer. And I haven't had a working printer on an ST since probably 1993. So that's going to be a lot of fun. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching. I will talk to you soon.